you remember to that's the recording? Yes, it is. You're going to record my. Stand over here, then they will see you. No, oh, but I don't, okay, don't to. want to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's I Squared seminar speaker, Dr. Sujin Yi from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Sujin earned a Bachelor's of Science with the highest honor from Seoul <laughs> National University in Korea. She then earned a master's in education and biology education from Seoul National University, followed by a master's in science in ecology and evolution from the University of Chicago. She earned her PhD from the University of Chicago <clears throat> and during her doctoral studies, she also worked at the University of Edinburgh. And then she did a postdoc at the University of Chicago before joining the faculty at Georgia Institute of Technology in 2004 as an assistant professor. She rose through the ranks at Georgia Tech from an assistant to an associate and earned her promotion to full professor in 2015. She then joined the Department of Ecology, Evolution and Marine Biology at the University of California, Santa Barbara in 2021. Sujin has received numerous awards and accolades, including the Blanchard Milliken Faculty Fellow Foundation Award and the Sigma Chi uh, Young Faculty Award. She was a Sloan Research Fellow, um, as well as a Brain Pool Fellow from the Korean Federation of Science and Technology. And in 2020, Sujin was elected as a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, one of the most fun things for me about Sujin's research program is that it has evolved um, as the field has evolved. Um, when she and I started in this field, we were very limited with tools um, in terms of scale and scope. Um, Sujin started out by looking at rates and patterns of evolution uh, in, with respect to polymorphism and divergence in Drosophila and a number of other systems. She moved into connecting sequence evolution with the evolution of function and the process of adaptation. As gene expression technologies became available, she uh, expanded into gene expression and protein-protein interactions. And more recently, as we learned about DNA methylation, her program expanded into understanding patterns of DNA methylation and the evolution of methylation and the consequences of DNA methylation for, uh, for gene expression. Her current program encompasses all of these things, integrating genetics, genomics, epigenetics, epigenomics, polymorphism, divergence, gene expression, molecular evolution, and the connections between these molecular phenotypes and functional traits. The diversity of systems, which you can see in part on this title slide, um, exemplifies how question-driven Sujin really is and how nimble she can be in her research program. She's worked on Drosophila, other obviously less interesting insects, social insects, humans, non-human primates, other mammals, cancer, plants, songbirds, bacteria, yeast, and several species of fish. Um, her menagerie includes my favorite system, which are the cichlids from the Great Rift Lakes in Africa. Um, and I thought my jealousy had peaked at that point, but last year, Sujin actually upped her organismic game and studied methylation patterns in koalas. Um, I have no idea what charismatic creature she's going after next, but my eight-year-old really hopes it's the unicorn. Oh. Um, Sujin's lab focuses on evolution, evolutionary epigenomics. She's interested in how fundamental biological patterns and processes are shaped by epigenetic regulation. Her group also works on the evolution of DNA methylation and how methylation affects phenotypic plasticity. Today, she'll be talking about her work on genomic and epigenomic um, studies of human brain evolution. Mm -hmm. So Sujin, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I so wish you were here in person. Um, I'm looking at the screen like you can see me, but really you're over there. Um, but at the same time, I can a thousand percent guarantee that the weather in Santa Barbara is far superior to what we're experiencing um, right now. Um, I'll remind everyone that there'll be a virtual tea time from 115 to 145 at this same Zoom link. Um, and Sujin, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Nadia. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect, perfect. I this that that was such a fantastic introduction. I I'm I'm confident I cannot follow up on that. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Nadia. Uh, really appreciate that. And um, yeah, so this slide I wanted to show you some of the species that I have worked with. Um, koala was a lot of fun, and I hope to continue on that. I will try my best to study unicorn, but I think I might fail. Um, but, you know, in my lab, we just got some samples of um, starfish and we are looking at some uh, mussels. So maybe, uh, you know, we were working on doing also more interesting uh, species. Yeah, so I've been very fortunate to um, meet and work with a lot of collaborators who, uh, you know, really helped me to be able to ask the questions that 
you know, evolution has experimented on and, you know, it's just been so fun. Um, but today I'm going to talk about um, our recent work on human brain evolution, which is obviously also another really fascinating um, system. So let's try this. Okay, let's see. Okay, all right, here we go. Okay, so I want to um, usually motivate this talk by sharing this uh, picture, which always gives me goosebumps when I uh, look at this incredible difference um, in the brain of human versus chimpanzee, which as we all know, is the, close, the closest extant relative of humans sharing high genetic similarity, only 1% sequence divergence, yet um, many phenotypic differences, including this tremendous size difference in brain. I should mention that this picture is taken by Dr. Todd Price, who is my close collaborator uh, at Emory University, as well as Yerkes Primary Center. So the human brain evolution can be really characterized as um, innovation at multiple scales. In addition to this size difference, you may have heard about um, other differences such as different brain regions having very different connectivities as well as functions at the scale of neurons, very different connections of neurons at the molecular level, gene expression, metabolites, and as I will show today, epigenetic changes as well and many other aspects. It is truly a fascinating system and I, I would say no biologist would not be interested in understanding how this uh, how this evolution and innovation occur in relatively short amount of evolutionary time. So there has been numerous previous studies and I'm gonna show two aspects of that to motivate my talk. First, when people had finally tools to investigate genomic and molecular changes, the hypothesis was then perhaps genes that are used by brain or brain specific genes might have undergone many uh, changes at the level of sequences or positive selection for genes specific to central nervous system. Uh, this has been proven the opposite. So in fact, brain specific genes, as we gather more and more of the more information on them are more functionally conserved than other organ specific genes. On the other hand, these expression studies find typically hundreds or thousands of genes that are differentially expressed between um, human and chimpanzee brains. So this is a classic problem of conserved genotype really leading to divergent phenotype formulated very early on, for example, in 1975 by King and Risen. And I'm going to make a promise today that I'm going to show you partial answers to this or new insights, I should say, because we are able to consider two very important biological features. One is a cell type heterogeneity. So brain has many different cell types. This is a classic picture. You don't have to be able to read this. I'm gonna show this slide again later, but I just want to demonstrate that even in the classical sense, there's multiple different cell types. They're doing important functions as well as at the single cellular resolution, numerous new cell types being discovered every day. And by considering this aspect of brain evolution, uh, we can understand some of the earlier controversies better. And another important contribution of our group's work is considering epigenetics, which you may have heard as connector between genotype and phenotype. Um, there's many components, which I will not discuss all today. I mean, I talk about DNA methylation, but other components I wouldn't have time to discuss. But suffice it to say that um, epigenetic markers are basically uh, mechanisms to label different genomes of different cell types um, in a different manner, manner so that they can uh, differentiate in terms of development and other aspects. So with, under this umbrella, I'm going to talk about three studies. So I'm going to briefly mention our study on differentially expressed genes between human and chimpanzee brains. And I'm going to spend the majority of time on uh, DNA methylation, which um, uh, it's just fascinating to me. And I'm going to connect it to uh, evolution of neuropsychiatric diseases uh, very pr briefly at the end. Okay, so first let's talk about differentially expressed genes. You know, what genes are differentially expressed between human and chimpanzee brains is one of the first studies when uh, microarray and you know, RNA-seq became available. And until our study, there has been some controversy 
regarding the nature of differential expression between human and chimpanzee. It is because some of the earlier studies, when people identify the differential expression genes between human and chimpanzee brains, um, you know, the, the nature of differential expression is such that either one species is over expressed or, the, or, or under expressed or higher or lower expression compared to the other species. And when they look at the directionality, people realize that the majority of genes tend to have upregulation in the human brain compared to chimpanzee brain. But some other studies did not observe this pattern. And um, this has become uh, a controversy, as I mentioned. So here are some of those studies. So the, one of the first study on brain gene expression comparison used microarray 2003, and they noted that there are more genes upregulating the human brains compared to chimpanzee brains. Uh, another study uh, next year, microarray, also um, confirmed this pattern. However, when people start looking at um, RNA-seq, they did not observe this pattern and then said maybe it was because of the bias in the microarray, which was of course um, generated from the human probes. Um, on the other hand, some other RNA-seq studies uh, reveal this pattern again. And why is this controversy important? It is because one way of understanding human brain evolution is that um, it might be the same gene products, but more, um, more of them in the human brain, especially for those that carries out neuronal activity and metabolic processes, which are essential to evolve this big and complex brain. So we wanted to um, ask this question again, using um, our tool to analyze the cell type separately because we had hunch that these completing patterns may be due to the undetected cell type heterogeneity of the samples, as well as uh, different parts of the brain. So to do such a study, we um, spent a lot of time um, identifying a good brain vision to analyze. And this is very important because our brains are big and there's a lot of vision heterogeneity in terms of cell types and functions. We had to find a, a place where it is unambiguously conserved between species. So, you know, we can say this is that reason in this species, that species. Um, yet has uh, importance in human brain evolution. So the first reason we looked at is a BA46 medial prefrontal cortex uh, shown in, in here. And this, uh, this is the human brain and this is chimpanzee and macaque brain. And I know you remember from earlier slide that chimpanzee brain is much smaller than human. One third exercises about this and macaque brain is much smaller. We enlarged it to um, show this region and despite this enlargement, you can see this region is much smaller in chimpanzee and macaque compared to humans. So this region satisfies the criteria that is highly conserved in evolution, but expanded in human. And um, many studies uh, suggest that this has uh, relevance in cognitive activities and late maturing um, and implicated neurodevelopmental and dis degenerative disorders. So we thought this is a great place to um, get started. So this is Dr. Todd Price, my collaborator, doing uh, the dissections. And this is myself helping with this brain surgery. So I'm very proud of have been a part of this uh, brain surgery activities uh, in the lab. And um, in terms of identifying cell types, now here is the classic diagram. As the first study, we focused on these major cell types identified. So this is the neuron, uh, you know, the charismatic cell type in the brain and many of the glial cells. And we focused on the oligodendrocytes, which are the major component of the glial cells. Some estimates range between 75%, up to 75% of all glial cells might consist of oligodendrocytes. Um, so we used um, nuclei markers to separate oligodendrocytes and neurons from other cell types. So our experimental flow follows. So we have human chimpanzee and macaque as an R group. We went into a uh, dissection of this region. And then we used the fluorescent activated nuclei sorting. I hope I said that in the previous slide. With using these nuclei markers for neuron and oligodendrocyte and separate the nuclei populations, which we then use for uh, downstream library construction. And then looked at the transcriptome as the first step. And I'm going to give a shout out to the team uh, early right now. 
So this was a collaboration between two PIs. So Dr. Todd Price is neuroanatomist and uh, Dr. Jana Konoka, a neuroscientist. And the nuclear sorting, uh, which took quite a, quite a time to um, optimize was done by Nori, Dr. Nori Yusui and Kazuya Toriyumi. And computational analysis were uh, performed by um, Isabel Mendizabar, Stefano Berto, and uh, Hyun Su Jung. I have some pictures of them. Uh, so here is uh, Jana Konoka and myself and uh, Stefano Nori and Tajia having a nice meal at a restaurant in Yokohama in one of our last SMB meetings. And this is um, my lab having one of the last barbecues before COVID. And this is uh, Isabel Mendizabar, Harris Jung. And since I have the pictures, I also want to show thanks some other students, uh, Paramita, who did the library construction with Tom, and Devika mapped uh, private data. Since I have the slide, I also want to thank my students, Shin Wu, who did insect epigenomics, and then who worked on a white through the sparrow project. I missed my lab, so I just wanted to show and thank everybody before I go further into the, um, the results. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some of the results from the differential expression study. So uh, now I'm gonna have the two panels, neuron, new N is neuron, and oligo olig2 is oligodendrocytes. And red is upregulation and blue is downregulation. So let's focus on humans first. So if you look at this diagram, uh, there's more red than blue for both cell types. In other words, there's more upregulation in the human uh, than downregulation in both cell types. So this confirms the uh, human specific upregulation in a clear sort of cell type manner. When you get, look at chimpanzee, uh, they have a similar number of up and down regulate genes, statistically are not different. These are highly statistically different. Now, another very interesting aspect of these results was that we saw a lot of changes in oligodendrocytes. And when we partition it in phylogenetically, we saw that most of changes occurred since the split of humans and chimpanzees, in indicating that oligodendrocytes, uh, far from the silent member of the uh, neuron, has a lot of different changes. And in fact, when we look at what genes are there, uh, we saw many genes involved in uh, human-specific neuropsychiatric disorders. So, so I am not gonna spend too much time on this, but I wanna show you then why the previous studies sometimes um, saw the uh, opposite pattern. So we went back to the previous studies and reanalyzed those data. So these are four of those studies. I think we focused on mostly next generation sequencing data rather than microarray data, because it was more compatible in terms of data that we've got gathered. And um, I just want you to look at this. So when you see this red cell, so uh, these are showing the enrichment of uh, this specific data set. So let me try to um, sort of talk, talk, talk it out. So when we look at a data set from Berto and Novik, and there are genes that's upregulated and downregulated in humans. Upregulated genes in this study were enriched in neuron-specific upregulated genes. And it was repeated over and over in all the other studies. All the upregulated genes in the previous studies were neuron-specific upregulated genes, but they missed all of the oligodendrocytes. And I think we think that this explains why some studies show the upregulation, up where some others, some others didn't. It's because when we dissect these brain samples, people try to get as much gray matter as possible, um, historically, because uh, people thought that's the interesting region. And gray matter consists um, more, they have more neurons than uh, glial cells compared to white matters. So if you have a lot of neurons in your data, because of their upregulation signal uh, in the total data set, we can observe the upregulation. But if your sample contains more white matter, then you do not observe this. So once you separate those cell types, uh, we can see those clearly. So these were. Um, so we, I, I feel like we were able to resolve the previous controversy and show that it is really important to consider cell type heterogeneity in this kind of analysis. So with that knowledge, we started looking at DNA methylation. Um, so DNA methylation is, um, I, I, you know, I think that um, I'm just gonna give a two minute, maybe one minute overview of DNA methylation. So I'm going to focus on cytosine methylation today. 
Uh, there is also adenosine methylation, but they're lower frequency, we understand it less. So when cytosine is not methylated in this position, which is C5, has hydrogen. However, um, many cytosines in the human genome and other vertebrate genome are methylated by uh, enzymes called the DNA methyltransferases. And when that happens, this hydrogen is exchanged with CH3 or methyl group. So in our genome, in any given time, we have many of these uh, five methylcytosines and uh, compared to cytosines. And this five methylcytosine has very different functional um, and chemical property compared to cytosine. So some people call it as the fifth base uh, in addition to ATGC uh, of nucleic acid. You probably heard about CPG methylation, which is uh, the most common type of DNA methylation. And that's what I'm gonna focus today. But let me just say that in neurons, in brain, but we show that in neurons, uh, C-methylation C can occur not just in CPG, but CPC, CPA, and CPT, which are collectively called the CPH as well. Most of you probably heard about DNA methylation in the context of gene expression. So um, the most famous example being that when promoters are methylated, maybe the gene tend to be downregulated. And when promoters are not methylated, gene tend to be upregulated. So it is generally true, but it's by no means perfect at all. So I'm gonna give you a little warning on that. And also when it occurs in uh, non-promoter regions, then the relationship is much more complex. DNA methylation is also a key feature of development. So in mouse cell lines, if we remove DNA methyltransferases, most of them don't, do not develop at all. So it's a key development um, uh, gene. Also process such as X-chromium inactivation and recombination. In terms of disease, DNA methylation has also tremendous implications. So cancer is one of the most famous epigenetic disease, if I will say. Uh, where DNA methylation is fundamentally altered, and also in neuropsychiatric disorder. So that's where uh, my interest came in. So there are many, many open questions on DNA methylation and human brain evolution. Uh, before our study, you know, there was no information on how DNA methylation evolved during primate brain evolution or primate evolution in general. And I think we begin to have some answers, but there's a lot more questions remaining. And the key question here, of course, is, you know, how do we connect this DNA methylation evolution to phenotypic traits such as gene expression and how does it connect to genome evolution? And finally, um, you know, what is the relationship between methylation evolution and neuropsychic diseases? So I'm going to try to give you some answers that we have gathered so far. Just the quick overview on the strategy. Now, I already talked about this, but I'm just gonna give a sort of formal overview of our method is comparative. So we compare human and chimpanzee because we are uh, partitioning changes occurred in this, since the split of human and chimpanzee to human to chimpanzee by using an out group. Um, in terms of sequence evolution, this has been well thought out. So for example, um, if we see uh, at the, when you know, comparative genomics was just uh, sequencing these genomes. Um, if you have a sequence stretch of sequence like this, when humans A and chimpanzees T and macaques A, then based upon how sequence evolution occurs in any of the models, Chuk's Cantor or Kimura or any models, the best, the most likely scenario is that uh, in the ancestor of human and chimpanzee, it was A and changed to T in chimpanzee. And likewise, if you see this kind of a layout, once again, the most likely scenario, and I think likely the difference was, I worked there, it was thousand to one or something like that, that this change occurred in human compared to chimpanzee and macaque. We also have a lot of changes like this, which we, we have to, um, we, we cannot use them because we cannot make a clear likelihood of inference anymore. So when I started looking at DNA methylation, I was wondering if we can use the same um, parsimony um, inference in DNA methylation or not. So that was one of our first study in 2016. Um, so we used whole genome methylome analysis. So compared whole genome methylome and then identified 
um, differentially methylated regions and use the parsimony inference to infer maybe it's a human specific change or chimpanzee specific change or changes that we cannot confirm. And then we did a validation study. So the large N is the um, initial study discovery and small N is the validation to see if this parsimony approach works for DNA methylation or not. And I, we looked at 38 regions from these many other species and for all 38, um, it was correct inference. So at least within this phylogenetic framework, which is within the cadarines, it appears that the parsimony framework to infer DNA methylation works really well. And we can find the region something like this, where you can see a lot of blues, which are the humans, are higher methylated. This y-axis methylation, x-axis is a location in a genome. It's a, one of the just random reason we identified as a differentially methylated. And you can see a lot of other colors on the bottom. So in other species, historically, they were lowly methylated, but humans accumulated um, more DNA methylation marks during evolution. So with this tool and using the um, other experimental methods, which I'm gonna say also, the method we use the whole genome bisulfide sequencing, that's basically resequencing of the whole genome but we uh, treat the DNA before we sequence with bisulfite. And what does bisulfite do is that it converts all the C's to T's, where U first and then uh, to T when we PCR later, but it protects the methylated C's from the convergence, so C remains as C. So um, we can separate the methylated and unmethylated C's uh, using this method by resequencing and by sequencing before the bisulfite conversion. I like this method because it gives the uh, sort of unbiased view of every nucleotide. Um, and there is a lower batch effect because, you know, uh, next generation sequencing methods have lower batch effects. Uh, there are some negatives as well, which I might mention later in the slide, later in the talk. So our experiment flow is the same sort of setup, but now we are looking at uh, whole genome sequences as well as whole genome bisulfide sequencing uh, results. So this is one of the first that we have found, and I was completely, um, I was really impressed when I looked at this figure. So regardless of whatever clustering method you use, in using you know whatever positions you use, this kind of complete separation is what you get. So neurons and oligodendrocytes have entirely different um, DNA methylation levels. So let me put it to perspective. So there's about 25 million uh, CPGs in the human genome. And um, to do the differential DNA methylation, we go by base by base and then do differential methylation analysis. And then we have to do correct for multiple testing. So there's 25 million positions. And the most stringent, stringent test is of course, bone peroni correction. Even if you do that, we see about 25% of positions differentially methylated between uh, the two cell types. So um, really extreme differentiation which correlates really well with uh, well-known markers of the two cell types. And uh, notice that this is for promoters because once again, uh, promoter methylation is um, the strongest indicator in, in terms of gene expression in this case. <clears throat> so another interesting observation that we had was that the two cell types showed often complete separation across the long range genomic regions, including whole gene. So this is one of the gene QKI. This is uh, actually oligodendrocyte specific gene. And this is the marker for 25 KB. So this, we are looking at over 100 KB region of this gene. And uh, these little dots and individual CPG positions in case you're wondering. Let's look at the human. Um, so the whole, across whole gene, uh, the two cell types are completely separated. And this is consistent in all three species. So that sort of shows that perhaps the cell type difference was established before the three species uh, have a split. And about 50% of all cell type difference were conserved in all three species. Uh, remaining about 25% was shared between human and chimpanzee. And then remaining 25% was human specific. Another way of looking at it is uh, this PCA plot. So this um, 
uh, circles are neurons, and then these triangles are oligodendrocytes, and then different colors are different species. But you can see the first um, separation is the cell types. Um, and then after that, we can see some other pieces coming in that connects with um, you know, species. So the cell type difference persists through phylogenetic relationships in cadarines, and this is going to become important later when we connect it to um, GWAS heritability studies. So I have shown you the conserved cell type differences. In some cases, however, we can also find the human specific changes as well. So this is a little more complicated diagram, but let's look at the um, lower panel first, which is oligodendrocytes. And there are three colors represent three different species. And those lines sort of coincide across the gene. In other words, there's a little difference between uh, the three species in terms of methylation. In neuron, however, while chimpanzee and macaque um, showed a similar methylation pattern, humans were different. So in our statistical test, this would show off as human-specific differentially methylated regions or DMRs. And more specifically, this is where humans lost DNA methylation according to our parsimony inference. So this will be human hypodmr. And many of these cases, we could connect it to gene expression if it happens in a genic region. And uh, you can see, for example, here, this is gene is upregulating human neurons compared to chimpanzee and macaque, where this gene is similarly expressed in oligodendrocytes of the three species. And I want to also mention that now with that information, we went into human uh, uh, epigenome database and then found that this DMR um, had some overlaps with many of these markers known as active. So as you know, ataxic open chromatin region, as well as um, these active markers of the histone modifications. So where are these human-specific hypo-DMRs occur? So many of these human-specific DMRs are actually within genes. So many of them are in the promoters, um, nearby genes. This is just to show that compared to the number of them, intergenic regions, which you know, occupies the largest amount of the functional annotated regions, is the smallest, while the other regions are overrepresented. And within the intergenic regions, we can go in and check the uh, annotated enhancers. And most of these were found, most of these intergenic, many of these intergenic uh, DMRs were found in uh, known enhancers of the human brain. So uh, we think that our, our uh, data on these hypo DMRs are the unidentified enhancers in neurons and oligodendrocytes. I want to also share a very interesting observation that we, you know, was not known before. So this is once again the, um, now we separate the DMRs to lineage, so human and chimpanzee. And we also separate to the loss of DNA methylation, which is hypo or shown in blue, versus gain of DNA methylation shown in red, hyper. So should strike you that there's a lot more blue in human neurons compared to hyper methylation or red. Now the same pattern can be seen in chimpanzee, but the difference is much less pronounced. Interestingly, in oligodendrocyte in both species, we have a lot of loss of DNA methylation during evolution. What's very nice was that we could connect many of these to the upregulate genes that I've shown in the first part of my talk. So here we have at least partial answer that some of this upregulation of gene expression that we observed in previous study and our study is um, attributable to uh, promoter hypomethylation in, um, that we have found. Um, I just wanna, so I'm not gonna say too much more about this, but I wanna say that we are currently exploring this at the single cellular resolution. Now, um, most of our single cellular studies are um, not on DNA methylation, but are toxic uh, for technical reasons. We are also working out the details of methylation, but it's uh, uh, more involved and takes more time. But we're also looking at single cellular resolution and finding that cell type heterogeneity is uh, really an important component of human brain evolution. So I'm going to move on to, oh, 
Okay, I, okay. My talk is not until one, right? It's until one fifteen. So I have a little. I have like ten more minutes. Just want to make sure I'm okay. Okay. That's right. You got plenty of time. Okay. Yeah. I just glanced my talk the timer and I was like, oh no, it's uh, twelve fifty two. Okay. So I'm going to spend a little time on how we can connect it to neuropsychiatric diseases. This was one of my interests, how I got into this sort of brain evolution was um, some of early studies or early reviews on human evolution. So, you know, when, um, when there was push to sequence the great ape and chimpanzee genomes, so one of the motivations or was that there's a lot of medical conditions um, that are very common in humans, but it's not at all in chimpanzees and great apes. And given the small genetic difference, uh, great apes can provide, you know, potentially important regions in the genome in the comparative genomics. So uh, these are taken by a couple of reviews in the early 2000s by Ajit Barkis group mostly. So the famous example being uh, HI infections leading to AIDS in human, but when chimpanzees are infected with their virgin SIVs, they do not show the symptoms of AIDS. Another famous example is of course, um, plasmodium infection and malaria. Uh, when humans, it is one of the uh, you know, leading cause of death until COVID, I guess, but now, um, I guess now much behind COVID, unfortunately. But anyways, in great apes, when they're infected, their plasmodium, they are resistant to uh, malaria. I don't know if you are aware about things like menopause, which is universal in humans, it's very rare in um, apes. So it, it's really interesting list of things, but also uh, I'm gonna you know, draw your attention to major psychosis such as schizophrenia, which is common in human populations. So in all studied human populations, about 1% um, of population suffer from schizophrenia. However, in great apes, um, decades of studies and thousands of animals in the captivity have not seen um, behavioral or pathological symptoms after their death in the postmortem of the schizophrenia or other major psychosis. So there has been some hypothesis that, um, that um, schizophrenia is due to the human, the consequence of the human brain and increased burden for cognitive functions. My motivation was that there are many studies indicating that DNA methylation is potentially altered in neuropsychiatric diseases such as schizophrenia. And those diseases are complex diseases, um, have a lot of input from environment um, as well as genetic risk and epigenetics as at the interface of those factors. So we hypothesized that if we identify this epigenetic loci on human brain, that has changed in the human brain, uh, perhaps it can give us some clues how that has increased or decreased risk to schizophrenia and neuropsychiatric diseases. And we want to look at it in a cell type specific manner. So this is uh, another way of showing it. It's from my uh, student, Han Hyun Soo Jung. So once again, we extracted neurons and oligodendrocytes from schizophrenia patients and control. And uh, we performed whole genome by cell by sequencing. And we also augmented with uh, targeted sequencing. So our whole genome by surprise sequencing was about approximately 25x coverage, but we uh, also did candidate regions. We looked at about, uh, I think, 100 regions. Uh, we did over 5,000x. I think the mean was a 15,000x or something um, to, to make sure that we are doing it right. And you know, they corresponded really well. So what have we found? So I'm going to show three findings. So first, you know, this was a big project. It's a lot of money, 100 whole genome by cell sequencing, uh, very expensive. We found a very small number of really, truly differential methylate positions. And here is where the statistical considerations come into play. As I mentioned, we have to do 25 uh, test correction for 25 million tests. And it is very challenging to identify small effect size differences. And this was the case. And I'm gonna show you how many we found in a later slide. However, two very strong pictures emerged. The one is that differential methylation between schizophrenia and control brains coincided with those that we have found previously as a cell type specific. So, you know, differential methylation between neurons and oligodendrocytes. 
the odds ratio was greater than four. And more interestingly, we found that the cell type difference is reduced in schizophrenia samples. So let me try to explain what I mean by that. So here is one way of looking at it. So look at the bottom, which is uh, randomly selected um, CPGs in the genome. We look at about 4 million. And um, we have two classes. So one is where, oh, I apologize. I think there are some uh, issues with my slides. But this is where control um, cell type difference between neuron oligodendrocytes are bigger in control compared to schizophrenia. Okay. So, and then the red or yellow is where you have a bigger cell type difference in schizophrenia samples compared to control. I apologize for the slide again. So if you look at randomly selected sites, about 50-50 show one um, cell type difference is bigger in control or bigger in schizophrenia as expected. Because there are so many sites, this is significant in binomial test, but you know, I don't think it's, um, it's a strong observation at all. Now we start to look at positions that are differentially methylated between cell types from our previous study. So the, those are sites that differentially methylated between neurons and oligodendrocytes as a whole. Then those sites show more difference in control compared to schizophrenia. And this pattern is weak, but very significant. Now we try to go more restrictive. So now we look at differential methylated positions that is in schizophrenia specific, and we look at top thousand positions. Um, and the reason we do it is because I think top thousand is already FDR 40% uh, or something. So we don't have too much statistical confidence, but those are top thousand DMPs that differential method between schizophrenia and control. And you can see the pattern is becoming more and more stronger. And we look at, and then so we restrict the data set for more statistical confidence, confidence for uh, differential methylation between schizophrenia. We see greater uh, proportion of those positions that are, um, that, that where cell type difference is greater than control. Another way of looking, once again, from my student, Hyun Su Jung, is that when we look at control individuals, the cell type difference between neuron and oligodendrocyte is big. But when we look at patient group, the cell type difference is reduced. So our current hypothesis is that this reflects um, early cell type epigenetic differentiation. Uh, because remember, these two cell types are highly differentiated, and their differentiation is um, complete very early in the development. So even though schizophrenia has later onset, um, our studies and many other studies actually in a different aspects indicate that schizophrenia may have earlier development at root. And we are exploring this further um, by uh, looking at once again at the single cellular level and identify potentially which uh, neuronal cell types are the most affected. And from there, we can maybe infer developmental events. So, um, Finally, I want to show you one more aspect of schizophrenia and evolution. So remember this slide where I showed you that cell type difference is persistent in the cadarine evolution. Uh, about 50% of cell type difference are observed in all three species. So we looked at these um, differentially methylated regions that's conserved in all three species or human specific, and then how they are represented in the GWAS hit. So as you know, the GWAS or genome-wide association study variants are positions where um, the SNPs explain significant but very small portion of heritability for many diseases. So for example, uh, we looked at multiple different traits and we separate them just uh, roughly to brain-related traits, Alzheimer, anorexia, schizophrenia, and educational at at attainment versus other traits, including BMI and you know, other diseases. And these are the uh, DMRs that, let me show you, okay, hold on. Like these guys, so conserved in all three species, but hypomethylated neurons. If you look at those, they show up as significant hits in many of these brain-specific diseases. So the um, cells with these uh, boundaries are those that's significant. And um, this is the p-value. So the, the more blue it is, more significant it is. And you can see schizophrenia shows up as the most significant hit for heritability. In other words, 
the conserved DMRs, that's differentiate between neurons and oligodendrocytes in all cadarite species, bears strong signal for schizophrenia heritability. Now, so this indicates it has deep evolutionary origin and it kind of coincides, confirms the idea that schizophrenia may have early developmental origin as well. Now, I'm gonna show you these guys. These are human specific neuron hypo DMRs. So these are much smaller in terms of size compared to these guys and nothing else is significant except schizophrenia. In other words, human specific changes of DNA methylation in neurons have provided additional significant contributions um, to schizophrenia. So we were very excited to find this observation. And this is, I, as far as I'm aware, the first confirmation or support for the idea that the um, evolutionary epigenetic changes in the human brain um, confers the risk for genetic risk for schizophrenia. I think that's all I have, but I'm gonna just give you a summary. So the contributions that we have discovered in this series of studies that's still ongoing um, is that first cell type DMRs are conserved in evolution and um, humans have less CPG methylation. So more blues and it coincides with more expression uh, because they happened in the regulatory regions. Now I did not have time to talk about CH methylation, but that's uh, fascinating. So CH methylation is increased in contrast to CG methylation in the human brain. And we have some data to show it is um, specific to uh, inhibitory neurons. And finally, we showed that cell type DMRs, including human specific ones, um, explain significant portion of disease heritability for schizophrenia. So with that, I'm gonna conclude my talk and acknowledge uh, collaborators and uh, members of my lab. Uh, now this, are, this, this is my lab at Georgia Tech. Uh, I think most, all of them have moved on. Um, now I have um, a talented postdoc and an undergrad student, and I'm looking for many more to join my group at UCSB and you know, work on these fascinating questions and many other questions. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, exploring or just talking about epigenetics and evolution, please feel free to reach out to me. And these are some of the funding organizations um, that have supported my, my work throughout the years. Thank you. And I'm going to take questions. That is hopefully okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sujin. Um, are there questions? Hi, Sujin, great talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about um, some of the downsides of um, whole genome bisulfide sequencing. It's something that I'm kind of looking at in my, um, my own research, and I just wanted to hear you kind of talk about maybe some of the, um, some of the weaknesses of that approach. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so it also depends on what species you're looking at, but if you're looking at species like humans, um, so what I recognize as a downside is first of it's very expensive, as you know, uh, compared to other methods such as RRBS. And it gives you a lot more data, but much of those data are uh, useless. And why am I saying useless? It's because very little variation. So the majority of positions in the human genome, when they're methylated, they're methylated throughout, they show very little variation. So the positions that bear the importance uh, or functional variation are very, very small portion. So you get a lot less than you, what you input. Um, so if I had a choice, if I had a samples, and so if I can choose between doing WGBS of 10 individuals versus RRBS of 100, I would go for the latter because you have a lot more, you have more chances of getting uh, meaningful positions. In addition, uh, as I mentioned earlier, even though you have so many, uh, so much data and they're non-variable, you still have to correct for all the positions, which provides um, very, you know, serious statistical challenge. So I would suggest to, I mean, in my opinion, I think RRBS is much better um, route. 
scientifically as well as practically. But I'm happy to talk about it more. If you're looking at other species where there's very few methylated positions, it might be different. Thank you. Other questions for Sujin? Go, go, go ahead, Andy. I think. Okay, yeah, I, I don't want to jump in if people have in-person questions, but Sujin, no, great, great talk. Um, really enjoy hearing the update as always. So I'm really fascinated by the, the human specific evolution side of this. And yeah. particularly, you know, I was, I was looking through the paper, this is the joy of Zoom, right? I was looking through the paper a little bit as you we were talking. Um, and I noticed that there's um, this connection with FOXP2 transcription factors, that, there, that there's this enrichment there. Yeah. Can you, can you make any broad brush statements about human specific methylation and um, accelerated evolution at the DNA sequence level along human lineages? Like, is there a connection there? Do we see uh, human accelerated regions often having human specific methylation? Yeah, I wonder if you can say more about that. Absolutely. And the answer is yes, a resounding yes. So, you know, as you know, we can identify human accelerated regions many different ways. It doesn't matter whatever way you define, you go for the first paper or 10th paper, different data sets, you always find that they are nearby um, differentially methylated regions. Having said that, it is not surprising because we find in general, the evolution of methylation is tightly linked to evolution of genome. Like, if you just chop the windows, I think I did that in this study and maybe it's in the paper as well. If you chop the genome and then calculate human gene divergence and correlate with methylation divergence, perfect correlation in a long, you know, even larger scale. So I don't think this, you have to have change right next to the position, but within, um, you know, like a 10 KB, you just wanna say regions or more, um, you have this complete co-variation between genetics and epigenetics, which is not surprising, once again, because um, there are many groups that have shown that if you clone out, you know, hypomethylate segment from mouse genome and then put it elsewhere in the mouse genome, they recapitulate methylation patterns. So a lot of people think epigenetics is just in between genome and epigenome, and it just does something different from genome but um, it's not the case in, in, in this species. I'm sure there's that contribution as well. It's harder to study in case of humans, um, but we can do more with experimental systems. Very cool, thanks. You're welcome. Other questions? Yeah, hold on. Hi, Dr. Yi, great talk. Um, I was wondering if, aging plays a role in like the methylation pattern or the changes that you see? Like if you compare an old person to an old um, uh, chimpanzee or uh, like well, the other apes that you looked at that I'm blanking on, um, like uh -huh. are they uh, yeah. biologically age matched? And do you think that might contribute to the differences that you see in the two? Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't have the slides here, but that was one of the foremost concerns that we had to really, um, you know, put into our thoughts before we set up the experiment. So we um, try to get, so these samples, especially chimpanzees are opportunistic collection. So, you know, it's hard to match, but so these are all adults and we'd love to analyze early developmental samples, but we cannot have them uh, in chimpanzees at least. Um, so these are all adults and these ages are in humans case, um, I think it was early adult, middle, and then later, uh, later up to like 80 something years old. And then we followed a paper that uh, my colleague Dr. Price published on brain imaging and then sort of match age between the three species at least. So we try to follow that age metric and then come up with the same sampling from chimpanzees and versus macaque, which we could do, luckily. Um, so that's the way we try to set up the experiment. And then we, incorporated age as a specific variable in our analysis. But I'm gonna tell you that aging, um, so in our data set, in the human and chimpanzee macaque data set, well, let's just talk about human. Schizophrenia explains about 3% of methylation variability. 
um, aging expense about twice of that. So there's a lot of impact of aging in DNA methylation, as you guys all know. And we are also working on um, a paper where we show that this aging and cell type difference, where cell type difference has something to do with aging as well. So I hope I answered your question kind of broadly, uh, but I'm happy to talk about more details. Awesome, thank you so much. So we're gonna take a break for like five minutes. Well, thank Sujin again for a terrific seminar. Thank you. Um, and everyone is welcome to join us virtually for uh, some more Q&A and chatting with uh, Dr. Yi at the same link. So thank you so much and we'll reconvene in like at 1.15.